Hello, uh, Professor O'Brien. Welcome. Can you hear me? Thank you. Yes, I can. Yeah, nice to Hi. meet you. Okay. Uh, can uh, you can upload your PowerPoint, and we will start at uh, twelve thirty. Okay. No problem. I shall uh, start to share my my screen. Yeah, it's great. Okay, brilliant. Thank, Thank you. Good afternoon, uh, everyone. I'm Dr. Chao Ronghu, the director of Dementia Center Songhe Hospital, Taipei Medical University. The Dementia Center commits to promote dementia care and uh, to update dementia knowledge for physicians and uh, uh, dementia care team members. We have already uh, had uh, 17 uh, master contributing to this continuous education program, Frontier in Dementia Research Master Lectures since that year. In this year, we have a, a great a sponsor from our AI company, and we will continue to invite master to share their experience with us. The master today, uh, the master today is Professor John O'Brien. Uh, Dr. Uh, O'Brien is Professor of Department of Clinical Neuroscience and the OH Psychiatry of University of Cambridge, UK. His research focuses on biomarkers, especially neuroimaging in the uh, differential and the early diagnosis of dementia. He is also the NHRI Clinical Research Network National Specialty Lead for Dementia and uh, member of several clinical guideline groups. The title of his talk today is Improving the Diagnosis and the Management of Lewy Body Dementia. Let's welcome Professor O'Brien. Thank you very much, Dr. Hu. It's a great pleasure to be here today to talk to you about uh, Lewy Body Dementia. Uh, these are my disclosures, just for the, the record. So Lewy body dementia, uh, dementia with Lewy bodies, what's in the name? Well, it's been quite complex, I think, uh, terminology over the years to decide what we should call things. And we've agreed, and this is uh, sort of internationally agreed now, that we use the term Lewy body dementia to talk about two closely related conditions, which we still think of separately to some extent, dementia with Lewy bodies, and Parkinson's disease dementia. These two very closely related conditions are really distinguished on the basis of their clinical presentation. So dementia with Lewy bodies presents either with dementia first or within one year of Parkinsonian symptoms. Parkinson's disease dementia is when dementia develops during the course of established Parkinson's uh, disease. The Lewy body dementia is a degenerative dementia, so it's a synucleinopathy characterized by abnormal deposition of alpha synuclein, and it has characteristic clinical and pathological features, as I'm sure you're all aware. Pathologically, you see Lewy bodies, so clumps of alpha synuclein, and also Lewy neurites. Now, there's a variable extent of Alzheimer pathology, uh, mainly uh, non-neuritic amyloid plaques, 
and relatively few tangles. So although there is often quite a bit of Alzheimer pathology, as well as the Lewy body pathology, it's not exactly the same type of pathology as you see in, in Alzheimer's disease. It's, it's qualitatively slightly different. Now, Lewy body dementia is age related. Classically, it affects men more than women. And it's common and it's underdiagnosed. So currently, and we'll see some data on this, it's around four to seven percent of all diagnosed dementias. But in pathological series, it's consistently found to be much more common, maybe 15 to 25 percent. And people always say, well, is it always is it really that common in pathological series? Well, if you look at the uh, uh, some latest data from a pathological study, this is the Brains Dementia Research Study in the UK, which followed people relatively unselected uh, and, and had autopsies on them. A large number, you can see 670 cases here, mean age of 83 years, so relatively representative group. You can see that not surprisingly, Alzheimer's disease was the most common cause of dementia, at just over half of cases. But look at the Lewy body cases. So 12% were what you might call pure Lewy body disease. And another 14% met the criteria both for Lewy body uh, dementia and Alzheimer's disease. So one in four cases, uh, yet another pathological series to show this, either had pure or mixed Lewy body Alzheimer's disease. So it really does seem to be a uh, common in terms of uh, pathology, much more common than we're recognizing it during life. How do we recognize it? And I'm sure, again, you're familiar with these core clinical features of dementia with Lewy bodies. So there's obviously cognitive impairment. Slightly different to that seen in Alzheimer's disease. So there tends to be relatively preserved memory, uh, but more in the way of attentional and visuospatial impairment. But it's quite variable. Some people with dementia with Lewy bodies can present with a very amnestic presentation, indistinguishable from people with Alzheimer's disease. So you don't always see this very characteristic clinical presentation, but at a group level, certainly people with DLB will have relatively preserved memory compared to people with Alzheimer's disease. So cognitive impairment is, of course, essential for the diagnosis of dementia with Lewy bodies. And then the core features are Parkinsonism, which can be variable, might not be present at all at diagnosis. In fact, in around 30% of cases, it may never develop during the course of the illness. Recurrent visual hallucinations. So these are often very florid, sometimes similar to those seen in delirium, but more persistent. And I think it's the, the recurrence of them uh, rather than anything else that is characteristic of dementia with Lewy bodies. So these are not just happening when people are unwell or happening a couple of times. They're happening, might not be that frequent, but they're recurrent. So they're happening over several months uh, or, or, or several years. And that's sort of recurrence that I think is particularly important in terms of the hallucinations. There's fluctuation, this marked variation in attention and alertness that's seen in people with DLB. And the time course of this can be different. It can be over minutes, over hours, you might observe it during a consultation, or it may be over days or weeks where people drift into a, a sort of co confused state that could be mistaken for delirium uh, and then sort of come out of it. So that fluctuation is very characteristic. And then REM sleep behavior disorders, sort of lack of the normal um, paralysis during sleep when you, you, you don't act out your dreams. So people with RBD will act out their dreams, they'll thrush around at night time, they'll shout out nighttime vocalizations, they might fall out of bed. The bed partner may have moved to a different room because of, of the disturbance during sleep. So Parkinsonism, recurrent visual hallucinations, fluctuation, and REM sleep behavior disorder are the core clinical features. Now, RBD, REM sleep behavior disorder is very interesting because it's been shown that it can be a predictor of future development of a synucleinopathy in people who are cognitively intact and don't have any motor symptoms. And this is nice work here from Ron Prostrimo, a large collaborative study which looked at people with
RBD, but without other symptoms. So they just had RBD and they followed them over time and they found that there was a risk of moving from isolated RBD to develop a degenerative disorder. And that was pretty much always a synucleinopathy. So either Parkinson's disease or dementia with Lewy bodies, or in some cases, multi-system atrophy. And the rate of moving from RBD to a degenerative disease was about 6% per year. And that was pretty constant over time. So you see some people have RBD for many, many years before they develop acinucleinopathy. So that's a major risk factor, or some would say an early presentation of having acinucleinopathy. Now, I mentioned concurrent Alzheimer's disease already in people with DLB, because I think this is interesting, and particularly with the advent of uh, new treatments for Alzheimer's disease, it's gaining more attention as to its particular relevance. And it does seem to have a relevance in DLB. So as I mentioned, amyloid pathology plaques are quite common. And if you look at people at the time they're clinically diagnosed with DLB, about 50 or 60 percent will be amyloid positive on PET imaging. Tau pathology, as I already mentioned, is much less common. There's some increase, but only probably in about 20 percent of people. Um, but the, the presence of the Alzheimer's pathology, whether that's amyloid or tau, it does affect the clinical presentation of the disease. So what's been shown is that if you have concurrent Alzheimer's disease, you are less likely to show the classic Lewy body phenotype of Parkinsonism, hallucinations, RBD, etc. Um, so it's going to be more difficult to diagnose DLB in the presence of Alzheimer's pathology. And it has also been shown, this is particularly from imaging studies, that the presence of Alzheimer's pathology does signify a worse outcome in people with DLB. So they tend to decline cognitively more if they have Alzheimer's pathology. And in terms of imaging studies, um, such as increase in brain atrophy or increase in tau over time, it has been shown that those with Alzheimer's pathology are more likely to have sort of uh, adverse brain consequences on imaging. And so that does raise the prospect of whether the concurrent Alzheimer's pathology itself might be a treatment target. But as yet, there haven't been treatment studies of the sort of Alzheimer component in people with DLB. And just in terms of other pathologies or other potential mechanisms, and I'm not going to go into any detail about this, but neuroinflammation is an area of increasing interest in several neurodegenerative diseases, um, always thought to be a late stage and a sort of reaction to pathology. But now there's increasing evidence from genetic studies, from all sorts of studies, imaging studies, serial uh, clinical studies, showing that immune changes seem to happen early in people with dementias and neurodegenerative diseases, and they might actually be important in driving disease progression. And so this is just some studies that have looked at this also in DLB and shown um, some early increases in markers similar in some ways between um, DLB and AD at the mild cognitive impairment stage. And I think this is also an area of potential interest because it gives another therapeutic angle um, that, that, that might then be helpful. And this is a brain imaging study that we did. So it's PET imaging using a ligand PK11195. It's a PET ligand that binds to microglia, so immune cells in the brain, if you like. And this is looking at people with DLB relatively early, uh, MMSEs above 24, and it's showing quite a significant increase in inflammatory signal, PET binding, in people with DLB compared to controls, particularly in sort of DLB specific areas, so basal ganglia and occipital lobe. So again, showing that this inflammatory change happens at an early stage. And interestingly, in this study, we had people who had more established and, and slightly more moderate dementia of Lewy bodies. They're shown in the yellow. And they actually tended to have um, a, a more normal pattern of, of, of microglial activation. So it looked as if this was happening relatively early in the disease and then was perhaps coming back to more uh, a sort of normal average state. So again, 
potential for therapies there, but but not not at the moment. That's something for the future. So what about diagnosis? Well, we have our consensus diagnostic criteria for making a diagnosis of dementia with living bodies. And we have the four clinical features that we've looked at. Fluctuation, recurrent visual hallucinations, spontaneous features of Parkinsonism and REM sleep behavior disorder. And not everybody will have all four. It will be quite unusual to see all four, um, although that can happen in people. So the diagnostic criteria rely on there being two or more to make a diagnosis of probable. Or one of these core features will allow you to make a diagnosis of possible DLB. And they're also indicative biomarkers as well. And these are um, imaging and other changes that have been closely associated with, with DLB with high specificity. And, and that's low dopamine transporter imaging, abnormal cardiac imaging, and, and REM sleep behavior disorder that's confirmed by polysonography. And I think the importance of these are that it's possible to use these indicative biomarkers to help you make the diagnosis of DLB. So if you just have one core feature, if you're able to access these biomarkers and one of the biomarkers is positive, that then allows you to almost substitute the biomarker for a core feature and make a diagnosis of probable DLB. So you can have fluctuation cognitive impairment, and then if you have um, RBD confirmed by polysonography, that would allow you to be diagnostically certain to call that a, a probable DLB case. Um, these are the biomarkers that, again, I'm sure will be familiar to you, the loss of the dopamine transporter on, on SPECT or PET imaging in a similar way that you see in Parkinson's disease. The abnormal cardiac imaging, so this is loss of the sympathetic uh, innovations of the heart. So DLB, like Parkinson's disease, doesn't just affect nerves in the brain, it affects nerves going to the gut, going to the heart. And it's possible to visualize the ones going to the heart using MIBG, which is taken up into sympathetic nerve terminals. And you can see the circle um, there in the Alzheimer case, there's, there's high binding of MIBGs indicating a normal a heart. And the circle in the DLB case, there's almost absent binding, showing that there's very little MIBG uptake there. And then the bottom is, is polysonography, so people coming in for a sleep study and showing that during dream activity, um, REM, uh, rapid eye movement sleep, when we dream, uh, there isn't the normal muscle atonia. So you've actually got muscles twitching during that REM sleep, which then confirms that someone has REM sleep behavior disorder. So they're indicative biomarkers. They're also supportive clinical features. So these are features which are common in people with DLB. One isn't surprised to see them in people with DLB, but they don't carry the same sort of diagnostic weight as the core features, simply because, and you'll see from looking at that list, because these are very common in other disorders. I mean, obviously depression, apathy, falls, we see those in all sorts of disorders. So they're not gonna be diagnostically specific, for people with DLB, but you won't be surprised to see them. And if you see them in, in someone who's got a diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease, it might just make you think, well, might this person have DLB and cause you to look for some of the core features or, or maybe look for some of the uh, indicative biomarkers. And as well as supportive clinical features, there are supportive biomarkers. And again, these are the same in the sense that they are fairly commonly seen in people with DLB, um, but they're not specific for DLB, so you will see them in other disorders. So these supportive biomarkers, relative preservation of the medial temporal lobe on structural imaging compared to Alzheimer's disease, and about 40 to 50% of people with DLB will have relatively preserved hippocampus and medial temporal lobe. Abnormal perfusion is, is, is common, but particularly this preserved posterior cingulate, which is highlighted there with the arrow from given the name of the cingulate island sign, where you see this preserved cingulate in the face of a sea of hypometabolism. And that's different from Alzheimer's disease, where the cingulate is affected uh, quite profoundly and quite early. And general slowing on the EEG with fluctuations. It's also 
characteristic of, of DLB. So you won't be making a diagnosis on these features, but you are not surprised to see them. And again, a bit like the supportive clinical features, it might well alert you to just question that diagnosis and, and look in more detail um, as if there, if there are any other features there, if there are any core features there. Now, DLB has finally made it to the big classification systems. So it entered DSM-5 some years ago, and it's now in ICD-11. And the criteria for ICD are not exactly the same as for the consensus criteria, but they're very similar. And clearly, one can see how they have moved from kind of research-based criteria to general clinical criteria. So you have need to have dementia and you need to have two or more of the features. Um, fluctuation is called here episodic confusion, but it's, it's, it's the same thing. And I think that's been very important for DLB because it's now reached the stage where it's recognised internationally where um, pharma companies, for example, uh, are interested in doing trials um, because it's a recognised condition and it's a common condition. Now, how common? Uh, we did a study in the UK called the Diamond Louis study that stands for improving the diagnosis and management of Louis body dementia. And we were interested in looking at current diagnostic practice and current management. And we looked at almost 10,000 referrals to representative memory and dementia services in the National Health Service in a couple of regions of the country. And we found that about 5%, just under 5% of people with dementia were given the diagnosis of dementia with Lewy bodies. Um, it was interesting that when we compared those people who were diagnosed with DLB with people who were diagnosed with other dementias, the diagnosis of DLB was longer and more complicated, more sort of difficult. Um, so almost half of people who were finally given a diagnosis of DLB had initially been given another dementia diagnosis, most usually Alzheimer's or, or mixed dementia. Um, we also found significant variation between services, and I think you can see that on the graph on the right, that, that some services have relatively high rates of diagnosis, um, up to the sort of 6% and others at low rates, more than 3%. And these are not rates we would expect to be different. These are very similar services. We would expect rates to be similar, and it, it looks like there's differences in, in diagnostic practice. And when we looked in more detail at the diagnosis, we did find, um, maybe not surprisingly, but it was interesting to see this. First of all, that there were very few possible DLB diagnosis, you can see here, um, these are two different regions, uh, blue and, and yellow. Um, but in both regions, you know, only 13, 22% of people were given a diagnosis of possible DLB. So if people are presenting to memory services and they have one core DLB feature, they're not really called DLB, they're called Alzheimer's disease with hallucinations or Alzheimer's disease with Parkinsonism. So we're not yet confident enough to say, I think you've got DLB, even though it's possible DLB, we're, we're calling them something else. Uh, the other was that um, a lot of people weren't making the diagnosis until people had more than the core features needed. So I mentioned already, you, you need two core features for probable or a core feature and an indicative biomarker. Well, in one set of services in the blue there, 57% of people who were given the diagnosis of DLB actually had three or more core features. So implying that, that maybe clinicians were waiting until it was quite late in the diagnostic course, really until they were very, very certain that someone had DLB before they wanted to use that diagnosis. And that degree of, of waiting until people were more certain was also associated with lower diagnostic rates. Again, not particularly surprising. So if people are waiting, until they're absolutely certain someone has DLB, they're going to recognise fewer cases. Um, the other thing that was associated with diagnostic rates was the use of biomarkers. So services that tended to use more in the way of biomarkers, um, particularly in the UK, that's the dopaminergic imaging, um, but any of them would be would be fine. Services that had um, 
lower rates of using that had lower diagnostic rates and services that use that more commonly, again, not surprisingly, had higher diagnostic rates. So I think there are changes we can make to our, our clinical practice that would help us recognise DLB uh, more, more easily, if you like. And Parkinson's disease dementia is not really the subject of, of the talk today, but we found that when we looked at movement disorder services in people with Parkinson's disease, uh, about 10% of people were diagnosed with Parkinson's disease dementia, which was a bit lower than the literature would give us to believe when we might have expected, you know, 20, 25%. Um, that was similar across all services we looked at, but again, there was some evidence that perhaps that diagnostic label wasn't being given to patients, you know, perhaps for all sorts of very good reasons. So even though people went diagnosed as Parkinson's disease dementia, we found that a lot of people um, were on anti-dementia drugs, uh, sometimes two years before that label was applied. So I think the clinicians were knowing there was cognitive impairment, they were even prescribing anti-dementia drugs, but they weren't actually telling people with Parkinson's disease that they thought they had um, dementia. So how can we improve diagnosis, assuming that diagnosis is, is a good thing? Uh, and we might come back to that uh, later on. So a review found four major initiatives around the world to try and increase DLB diagnoses. One was based around the US National Alzheimer Centers, and that was a sort of DLB module. So this is a long, complicated, um, a sort of clinical assessment if people are suspected of having DLB it's quite time consuming it's not really compatible with with clinical practice or a research-based assessment the Lewy body dementia association in the US has a diagnostic symptom checklist that's particularly for people with DLB and their families to help them identify symptoms and the idea is that they will then be able to discuss those with their clinician uh, Jim Galvin has developed a Lewy body competent risk score um, and we also developed an assessment toolkit. So this is the Lewy body dementia diagnostic symptom checklist. If you look at these symptoms, you'll immediately see, oh yes, these are things that we see in people with DLB. They're a sort of combination of the core and the supportive clinical features. Uh, and as I say, they're really to alert people who have DLB or may have DLB, that some of the symptoms they have might actually be related to the uh, dementia of Lewy bodies rather than a sort of second condition. So that's sort of raising awareness. This is Jim Galvin's composite risk score. Again, if you look at the items there, these again are a mix of core and supportive features. Um, they provide a sort of framework and he developed a, a score that if you had three or more, you were likely to have DLB. So that's a bit of a, a, a sort of tick box looking at symptoms. And we, my colleague Alan Thomas in Newcastle, developed these assessment toolkits. And the approach we took was not just um, a tick box approach, although we, we, we did, you know, do that. So if you look at the toolkits and they're freely available, you just type Diamond Louie into your your favorite search engine. There's a front end of them, which is simply reminding people what the diagnostic criteria are. So the things that you need in order to make a diagnosis. Um, that's the less interesting bit, but it's kind of useful uh, uh, reminder. The more interesting bit is the questions that we need to ask to try and elicit some of these symptoms. And these are all validated questions that have been looked at in other studies and shown to be strongly associated with the clinical feature they're trying to elicit and also associated with with DLB. So there are four questions to elicit cognitive fluctuation that are asked of the carer. Um, there's a question about REM sleep behavior disorder. This is developed from the Mayo Clinic. A single question. Have you ever seen the patient appear to act out their dreams while sleeping? Punch or flail their arms in the air, shout or scream. Um, and that's been shown to be quite sensitive for REM sleep behaviour disorder. Questions about visual hallucinations, how to elicit those, both for the participant and the carer. Eyes playing tricks on you. Um, does the person, patient have hallucinations such as seeing false visions, things like that. 
and also a simple scale for looking at Parkinsonism. And so this was developed because it's been shown in previous studies to be independent of cognitive impairment in terms of uh, assessing Parkinsonism. You know, some of the tests and exam we use for Parkinsonism, it, it can actually be influenced by the degree of cognitive impairment people have. Uh, and this picks up the main features of Parkinsonism. It's very simple, looking at rest tremor, genetic tremor, um, facial expression, uh, rigidity. So you're looking at rigidity, bradykinesia and tremor, and a uh, score of greater than seven was shown in previous studies to be suggestive of, of Parkinsonism. And there's a similar toolkit for dementia and Parkinson's disease because the, the diagnostic criteria are slightly different for dementia and Parkinson's disease, but broadly similar. So you have to have established Parkinson's disease and then have cognitive impairment sufficient to, to meet the criteria for dementia. So these uh, toolkits, as I mentioned, are freely available. There are also a couple of um, supporting videos to show how these toolkits can be used, how to assess these in clinical practice. And, and the whole aim of these toolkits was to have a series of literally five or six questions that would elicit hallucinations, fluctuation, um, and RBD, and then a very simple clinical exam that can be done in sort of 30 seconds or so just to um, make us uh, think about Parkinsonism and, and look at that. So to increase the awareness of those sort of symptoms. We did actually look at this in terms of the Diamond Lewis study. We um, looked at services at diagnostic rates beforehand, and I talked about that, the rate of just under 5% of DLB in terms of people with dementia who were diagnosed with DLB. We introduced these toolkits and we went back and had another look at diagnostic practice, and we found there was an increase in the number of DLB cases that were diagnosed, and that went up from you know 4.6% to 6.2%, relatively small increase, but it's actually another, um, you know, it's actually a 35% increase. So for every three DLB cases that were being diagnosed before the toolkit was being used, a sort of extra case was being diagnosed. So there are ways, I think, with our current clinical assessments and practice, we can, we can recognize DLB uh, more than we are. Um, other ways of recognising DLB, well, blood biomarkers are all over the place, really. Uh, I'm just back from the AIC conference in, in Amsterdam last week, and this really is moving at a pace. We have um, phospho tau in blood, different epitopes. Uh, we have the A-beta ratio that doesn't seem to be terribly helpful. We have neurofilament light and glial fibrillary acidic protein. And these are all you know, useful biomarkers. Um, this is a study that we did in Cambridge, though, and it's showing these different biomarkers in different diagnostic groups. And all these lines here are showing discrimination between different groups, um, uh, diagnostic curves. And you'll see that the, um, it doesn't really matter the groups, but the sort of blue, the green and, and, and the black lines are showing that all these markers have, have reasonable diagnostic accuracy in distinguishing Alzheimer's disease, either from controls or from other dementias, frontotemporal dementia, or progressive supranuclear palsy and other degenerative condition. But you'll see the red lines there that don't do terribly well in, in diagnostic terms. And the red line is looking at these markers in distinguishing Alzheimer's disease from Lewy body dementia. And so the point I'm really making here is that I do think these blood biomarkers are incredibly um, uh, and well, I think they're going to be very, very important and there are lots of strides being made. But at the moment, we don't have biomarkers to distinguish DLB from Alzheimer's disease. Uh, they may well come, but we don't actually have them at the moment. What we do have, though, uh, is, is an assay from CSF. So um, this is this, this one seed, so-called seeding assay, and this is a method where you're able to detect abnormal synuclein and the idea is you you put the abnormal synuclein in with normal synuclein, you kind of shake it up, um, or, or there are other methods of doing this, and then abnormal synuclein turns the normal synuclein abnormal, if you like, uh, and then you're able to detect that. So you can start off with a very small quantity of this abnormal synuclein, 
and it will actually give you a readout showing that pathological protein is present. And this has been shown, the CSF test, to be very, very highly accurate, both in Parkinson's disease and dementia with Lewy bodies. So figures of 90% sensitivity and specificity are being reported. It's still relatively early days. Um, you know, not every sensor can do this assay. There's still some issues about reliability and, and setting it up. But I think when you see diagnostic figures like this, it really gives you hope that this might be the next generation of, of markers that might help us diagnose DLB and Parkinson's disease. But of course, the, the only reason for diagnosing something is if you can do something about it. Um, are there different things that we do with DLB? Well, outcome in DLB is different. Unfortunately, outcome in DLB is not good, even compared to Alzheimer's disease. So a number of studies have shown that outcome is worse in DLB than Alzheimer's disease. People have lower quality of life rated by themselves and their carers, greater degree of hospitalization and higher mortality. So these are two graphs here from large hospital series e-record data. So relatively unselected people presenting to secondary care. Um, you can see on the left here that hospitalization after diagnosis is much, much higher in DLB than Alzheimer's disease. This is acute hospitalization. And on the right, you'll see mortality. And again, you'll see that the uh, mortality after diagnosis in DLB is strikingly high compared even to Alzheimer's disease. So the mean survival in DLB is only around half that. And you'll see that males are living only about three years, females four years after diagnosis in DLB. So a significantly poor outcome in, in DLB. Um, what can we do about it? Well, my colleague John Paul Taylor uh, undertook a series of systematic reviews looking at the sort of best management in DLB and indeed Parkinson's disease dementia. So these are management toolkits for Lewy body dementia across the board. Um, there's quite a bit of evidence out there. There's quite a few evidence gaps. And the way evidence gaps were dealt with was by putting together an expert Delphi panel, an expert clinical panel, who then said, well, there isn't any evidence on this, but we think this is the way one should treat these symptoms. So, you know, RBD is probably a classic. There aren't particularly good randomized controlled trials of RBD in, in people with Lewy body dementia. But there's a lot of literature and a lot of trials on how to manage RBD outside of dementia. And the feeling was that that evidence could be transposed to DLB management. So I can't summarize the, the whole toolkits in, in one slide, but this is just to give you a feel both of how they were structured. So the idea was to look at the main symptom domains that are affected in DLB, cognitive, neuropsychiatric, sleep, autonomic and motor symptoms, and then to look at some of the main evidence-based uh, treatments. So obviously for cognitive impairment, cholesterol inhibitors, question mark over momantine, there's actually a study going on at the moment, the cobalt study looking at randomizing people to either take momantine or placebo um, for one year to see if that helps people with DLB. Um, treatments of Parkinsonism, RBD, et cetera. Um, so these toolkits, I hope, are useful for clinicians. Again, they're under the search term Diamond Louie, you'll see the toolkits. And there's also sort of video support for how they might be administered. Um, we did a study looking at long-term use of cholesterol inhibitors, and this is a naturalistic study, so it's not a randomized trial. We see there very selected factors that might come into play. But it's quite a large study. It's over 600 people treated with cholesterol inhibitors, plus or minus momantine. We tried as best we could to control for socioeconomic status and, and physical comorbidities. And we found that long-term use cholesterol inhibitors was actually associated with reduced mortality with a hazard ratio of, of 0.67. And you can see here the red line um, are people who are, are not taking medication compared to the yellow and blue lines, people taking cholesterol inhibitors or cholesterol inhibitors and momentine. And you can see the increase in survival 
Now, as I say, this isn't a randomized trial, so I don't want to make sort of too much of this, but I think what it does do is provide evidence that long-term use is, is not unsafe. So there were worries about long-term use of cholinesterase inhibitors in, in people that might have cardiac problems because they have DLB, um, might be frail because they've got comorbidities. And we certainly don't find any evidence of an increase in mortality in people given cholinesterase inhibitors. In fact, the opposite might actually be, be good. So that's something to bear in mind when we're thinking about this high mortality in DLB, maybe long-term treatment with cholinesterase inhibitors might actually be, be helpful in that regard. Where are we going with DLB? Well, as with Alzheimer's disease, obviously thinking about the early stages for the reasons that if you want to do something in terms of disease modification, clearly one wants to get in as early as possible. I think early diagnosis of DLB is more difficult than early diagnosis of Alzheimer's just because people might present in many different ways. They're not always going to present cognitively. They might present with hallucinations. They might present with mood disturbance. We talked already about REM sleep behavior disorder as a presentation. And they might present with one of the supportive clinical features like falls. So it's going to be more varied. Um, the group led by Ian McKeith looked at the sort of evidence base uh, at, at the time. So this is a couple of years ago now, but nonetheless, felt there was sufficient evidence really to come up with diagnostic criteria for a sort of cognitive presentation of, 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 of DLB. So the condition was called mild cognitive impairment of Lewy body type. And you can see from the criteria here, they're very similar to the mild cognitive impairment criteria for Alzheimer's disease. Um, so you've got to have cognitive decline, not enough to be demented, and then to have one or more of the clinical features for, for, for DLBs, the fluctuation, hallucinations, Parkinsonism, or RBD, or indicative biomarkers. And unlike the criteria for mild cognitive impairment due to Alzheimer's, these were divided into sort of probable or possible um, type. Now, there have actually been quite a few um, studies already on mild cognitive impairment of body type. And perhaps not surprisingly, if people with MCI Lewy body are compared with MCI Alzheimer's disease, Lewy body features are more common, but that's just circular because that's what you use to make the diagnosis. Interestingly, supportive features are also more common. Now, these weren't actually used to make the diagnosis, but again, it's not surprising. If you have a group with early um, Lewy body dementia, you know, prodromal dementia, you're going to see these features. Um, the indicative biomarkers were helpful to some extent. So they were abnormal, maybe in 60, 65% of cases, um, rather than sort of 80% in established DLB. Um, but the specificity was high, even though sensitivity was low. So they're probably useful enough in some cases they might be useful enough for determining groups but obviously if a biomarker is only 60 percent sensitive then you're going to miss a lot of cases and you're not going to put huge diagnostic weight probably um uh, certainly if it's negative um and then other dlb features in a, a record study you know for all psychiatric autonomic features so i suppose this evidence gives us confidence we can start to identify prodromal DLB, um, certainly at the sort of MCI stage, uh, maybe at a sufficient level for us to be able to study it, um, hopefully in the future to undertake sort of clinical trials. What about clinical trials? Well, there is now increasing interest in DLB again, having been, you know, decades, I think, without a lot of interest after the cholinesterase studies. And so now there are studies being done looking at potential disease modification, whether that's around alpha-synuclein urinal function, or whether that's, as I mentioned earlier, around the kind of concurrent Alzheimer type pathology. So I think there are a lot of exciting avenues here. Um, maybe the, the drug that's sort of furthest advanced is niflamapimod. Um, which is something that has, has a number of different actions, really. It inhibits protein kinase. Um, so it has an effect on the inflammatory 
states. Uh, so reducing that, and I talked about that a little bit earlier, which is interesting, but it also has other effects on, on tau and endosomes and neuronal plasticity. Um, also in terms of, of protecting kind of cholinergic uh, neurons as well. So a, a broad actions, and I guess if it works, we don't really know how it works, but there was a phase two study, a send a Lewy body dementia, which was relatively modest, 91 people, um, but nonetheless, it was placebo controlled. And it did show an improvement in people with DLB who were given the drug, particularly the high dose of the drug, compared to placebo with an improvement in, in cognition. Um, interestingly, people did better if they didn't have concurrent Alzheimer pathology as indexed by phosphotau in the blood. And now there's a plan to do a much larger phase 2b study to start um, this year looking at whether the flamapimod is helpful in people with DLB and this is you know sort of the first large phase study in DLB that, that I can remember for, for a long long time so I think that's quite exciting to see that um, start and to see that interest again. Uh, we looked at other compounds um, repurposing is a flavor of the, the day in many ways, taking a compound that's got an evidence base in other diseases. If it works in another indication like DLB, then obviously your pathway to get into clinical practice is a lot quicker because you know quite a lot about it. It's already licensed, etc. This was an a, a expert Delphi panel um, that looked at different compounds and was asked the question, do any of these compounds have sufficient evidence um, to be looked at in Lewy body dementia. So this is DLB or PDD. And interestingly, there were there were 70 compounds that were initially suggested. Um, nine were then looked at in a lot more detail. And of those six were felt to have sufficient evidence to enter clinical trials. And you can see the list here. Um, and Broxol was the top one. Um, uh, uh, but there were a, a number of other compounds that had effects on so nuclein, um, you know, inflammation um, or other factors. And some of these are now entering uh, uh, clinical trials, which I think is also uh, interesting. So there's sort of novel compounds and maybe some established ones that might be helpful for DLB, certainly clinical trials that, that can be done to, to answer that question. So just to wrap up, I've tried to make the case that, that Lewy body dementia, particularly DLB in terms of the talk today, is important to diagnose. The management is different. It takes you down a different path, um, has different outcome. I think it leads to different conversations with the patient and the family, which is why it's important. I would suggest we all need to think about DLB when diagnosing or in fact reviewing people with dementia because some of these symptoms will not be there at the beginning. And we know from Diamond Louis that 50% of people with DLB are actually given another diagnosis first. So we should think about RBD fluctuation, hallucinations, and we should look for Parkinsonism. If we have access to biomarkers, we can use them. Um, in terms of the management, think holistically, think of all the domains, not just cognition. Think about sleep, think about motor symptoms, can they be helped? I think cholesterol inhibitors should be the core of management for people with DLB, assuming, of course, they could be tolerated, but other symptoms are important. Um, some promising signs for future therapeutics, but it is very, very early days. We've come a, a short way and we have a, a, a long way still to go. I'd just like to thank people that have worked with me on the studies. I've talked about um, Diamond Louie and others and thank our funders as well. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we thank uh, Professor O'Brien's uh, wonderful talk. Uh, now, uh, Professor's talk is open for question or uh, comments. Uh, first, uh, I uh, see the, the slide show the uh, vascular uh, dementia is uh, maybe only 7% in pathology uh, in your study. Uh, actually, in Taiwan, we believe uh, vascular dementia is the second common cause of dementia. It's mainly accounted for about uh, 
more than uh, 25% of uh, dementia patients. Uh, do you uh, have any comment about uh, this, uh, uh, this issue? Yes, so I think it was surprising to see vascular dementia so low. Uh, I, I have several different thoughts. I mean, I think that sometimes, first of all, I think that rates of dementia will vary by country and by population. I think that's undoubtedly so, um, and there is, you know, some evidence for that. I think, again, some studies in the UK have shown sort of reduced rates of vascular dementia over time. So, um, you know, big, big efforts to treat blood pressure in primary care, things like that. I think they might be feeding through. That's partly speculative, but the cognitive function and aging study did look at at dementia rates 30 years apart using the same methodology and they actually found a reduction in dementia rates over time which again was a bit of a surprise and a lot of that there's some Swedish studies in Skoog suggesting that better vascular care might be part of it <clears throat> so I, I I think that's that's one thing I do think they there might be a tendency to <laughs> UK to overdiagnose vascular dementia so particularly white matter lesions, which I think we we all thought were just vascular. And it's now known that they might be associated with degenerative change and tau pathology. So I think there might be a tendency to put too much reliance on, on that. But no, I like you, I was, I was very you know, surprised. Mm -hmm. OK, thank you. Uh, the, uh, there are uh, a few questions from our audience. The first one is in people with DLB, Amyloid pathology diminished core features presentation, but not determined by a uh, Lewy body uh, load. Are they uh, different in accumulation location? Uh, are these core features interrelated to each other in terms of a uh, pathophysiology of uh, and the pathology? So that's a that's a very good question about the, the determinants of of them. Um, I think they are related to different pathophysiologies. Uh, so, for example, the fluctuation uh, and and some of the sleep problems seem particularly related to changes in the, the thalamus and the particular pontine nucleus and and have a sort of cholinergic basis, whereas the motor symptoms you know, perhaps obviously would have more basis in, in dopaminergic change and in, in kind of stratum and substantia nigra. Um, hallucinations sort of, it's it's a mix. I think again, the sort of cholinergic um, um, loss there seems to be particularly important and the balance between serotonin, noradrenaline and, and acetylcholine. So again, more a Maybe a transmitter based rather than anything else, but different transmitters. Um, so I think I think yes, I think there are you know differences, and I think that's why we see different core features in different people because they they have different different pathologies, different sort of areas. It's not always spreading. It's been shown, you know, in Parkinson's disease, is a relatively um, consistent way that pathology spreads. Um, but in dementia with Lewy bodies, it can be much more variable. So sort of, sort of brainstem first or cortex first or, or, or limbic first, and that will dictate the kind of symptoms that people present with. Yes, thank you. The second one uh, is, uh, thanks for your informative talk. I saw a patient with cognitive decline, marked Parkinsonism, uh, including uh, body kinesia, rigidity, and uh, anticholics visual hallucination and delusion. Meanwhile, uh, he had uh, marked hippocampal atrophy evidence on brain CT, given a hospital uh, setting without uh, uh, nuclear uh, medicine department nor a PSG facility. Can I confident of giving diagnosis of a DLV? Well, um... You know, I would say I would say yes. I mean, I think I think we we should we should go with the criteria, and uh, uh, certainly from from what you're saying, there there are plenty of cri core criteria to make a diagnosis of probable DLB. Uh, 
the hippocampal atrophy i mean it's it's only in about 40 you know 40 to 50 percent of people you see this preservation so there are a lot of people with dlb that have quite a marked hippocampal atrophy and that might well be associated with the kind of concurrent alzheimer pathology that they that they have so if if the question was is that is that putting you off making the diagnosis because they've got a lot of atrophy i'd say well obviously you would you know you, you you'd think a bit about it but but no case is a kind of classic case that has everything and i think there's enough in your case if there aren't other reasons for these symptoms um to be to be confident in making that diagnosis uh, create a mixed type like ad plus drb for this case um so i i don't i don't know the benefit of of making that diagnosis to to be honest and i think that when if we're trying to guess the amount of outside pathology we're we're probably you know not going to be right a lot of the time so i think i think yes i mean i don't think there's anything wrong but with that but i it, I don't think it's as simple as saying if there's hippocampal atrophy, there's Alzheimer's pathology. I think we still need to understand a bit more about the sort of reasons people have different patterns of atrophy. If if it's a helpful label for the for the patient or for management, um, you know, I, I'm not sure what it's like in Taiwan, but I know for time in the UK, and unless we said that someone had Alzheimer's disease, we couldn't prescribe cholinesterase inhibitors. Mm -hmm. So there might be other reasons for using that diagnosis. So I don't think it's wrong, um, but I'm, I, apart from that, I'm not really sure what it what it adds. Okay, thank you. Um, another question is: uh, People with DLB have a shorter expected survival than AD. Is there any uh, hint to death straightens and uh, what to do to improve the survival? For DLB patients, is, is sorry. Is there any hint to what was that word? Uh, for uh, uh, death straight straights, uh, it means uh, it, uh, death of course. Oh, course the, of the, death. The course. Sorry. Death. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. So, so that again is a is a very good question. So, not not entirely clear. We um, did look in us in a small group as to the cause of death and. I mean, the cause of death is, is is pretty similar to the cause of death you see you see generally, but there were more aspiration pneumonias. So I think that that might well be, and again, that's not you know a huge surprise, is it? But that's interesting. So maybe we need to pay a bit more attention to you know swallowing and and and, and other things, um, particularly towards the end of life. Um, in terms of what to do with it, well, I mean, I you know what. We need to we need to know a little bit more about um, uh, about some of the factors I think associated with it. So I mean that that finding on aspiration pneumonia is is sort of relatively new and needs to be replicated, etc. But there might well be other things. Um, what I would hope, and that's a hope rather than anything evidence based, is that if you sort of optimise all aspects of management, you you are you are likely to be you know, helping people generally. Um, it doesn't surprise me, and I'm sure it doesn't surprise any of you that people with DLB have a poor outcome. They have motor symptoms, they have cognitive symptoms, you know, neuropsychiatric symptoms, sleep symptoms, cardiac issues, you know, all sorts of things that are kind of not good to have. Um, but if we try and optimise them, and we've got that little bit of evidence, albeit from an uncontrolled study, that cholinesterase inhibitors might reduce mortality. Uh, I, I think if we try and optimize functioning in all areas uh keep people mobile um you know make sure they're not having distressing symptoms make sure they're sleeping properly all those kind of things i think that has to be the best we can do at the moment to try and in, in improve outcome yes uh, regarding the mci drb uh do you think we can do something for uh, these people's Regarding, uh, uh, yeah, it's my my question. Uh, not sure in the screen. I, I my question is uh, about the uh, MCI DLV. Uh, 
I, I mean, uh, do you think we should do uh, anything for uh, these uh, patients? Well, that's a very good question. I mean, you know, it's it's hard, isn't it? Because it's tempting to prescribe cholinesterase inhibitors, but we, we don't actually have the evidence for that. I think what would be good is to do some clinical trials on that population because we know from the trials in Alzheimer's that you can't just assume that someone with MCI is going to benefit. So that's really what I would like to see. I think it, I think in practice, though, a lot of people are putting people on cholesterol inhibitors a bit earlier, particularly if they have clinical features that they think will benefit from it. So, you know, hallucinations or, or fluctuation, et cetera. Okay, thank you. Uh, because we have run out of our time, so we thank uh, Professor O'Brien again for his wonderful talk. His talk is very uh, clinical relevant, and he uh, taught us uh, to improve the diagnosis of DLV in uh, pre um, clinical practice. I, I think uh, uh, his talk is very useful, useful for our uh, uh, for our uh, uh, carrying the patients. We thank uh, uh, Professor O'Brien again and uh, hope he can uh, visit us in person in the near future. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Goodbye.